Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the HP Leader podcast. And this podcast is one of a series of COVID-19 HP lessons learned. And this session in particular is a really important one and one that I've actually not considered really until the last two or three weeks while I was speaking to people who had been affected by the COVID-19 crisis in many different ways. And this podcast is about our shielded workers. And one thing I've noticed more recently, like I said, over the last three or four weeks, is the emphasis has been almost completely on our frontline working staff. And as any of us know that's listening to this, the NHS is a big, massive team made up of so many different factors and people and services. And our allied health professionals are no exemption to this. So without saying too much, um, I'm going to ask first of all for the panel to introduce themselves. So we're starting with who they are and what they do. So Kat, can I come to you first, please? Hi, my name's Kat Lewis. I'm a speech therapy team lead for Adult Acute working in the southeast. I was doing that before COVID. When COVID hit, I was departed to home um, to work on whatever teams could send to me, which was writing policies. Um, getting everything up to date um, and writing reports. So I started to see some patients remotely later on. Thank you, Kat. Coming down to you, Ross. Uh, my name's Ross Hotton. Um, I'm a BAM5 rotational physio. Um, before COVID, I was working on the ITU um, in Wales, but during the pandemic, I've been shielding at home. Thank you, Charlotte. Hi, my name is Charlotte Hallis. I'm a specialist physiotherapist um, pre-COVID in the respiratory team working on the surgical wards and intensive care. Um, during COVID, I've been in the office, non-clinical, supporting the team from that side of things. I work at Calderdale and Muddersfield NHS. Thank you. Lauren. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Barbell and I am a band five rotational physiotherapist um, and I'm working in the Bath IUH Trust. Pre-COVID, I was going into my second rotation for paediatrics and outpatient. Um, and now during the shielding times, I've been at home and transferred to the MSK virtual service. Thank you. Lorna. Hi, I'm Lorna Gambarini. I'm a speech and language therapist working in voice and head and neck cancer in the northwest of, Scot uh, northwest of England, not Scotland. Um, before shielding, I had a clinical role in both voice and head and neck and a management role. And during shielding, I've carried on those roles as much as possible from home, seeing patients uh, by remote access and supporting the team as best I can. Thank you. And Sasha? Hi, I'm Sasha Johnston. I'm a research paramedic working in the south of England. Um, Pre-COVID, I was running a research trial and that was suspended. And uh, during COVID, I've been shielding and working from home on various projects, whatever is needed. Thank you, Sasha. So a little bit of background to the, this particular episode of the podcast. Um, I don't think we probably appreciate as an HP community quite how many of our staff needed to shield for very different reasons. And the enormity that COVID-19 hit the UK, in particular pockets of the UK as well, was quite at some speed. And the focus at that time, as a manager speaking as myself, how I was preparing the workforce, I was preparing the acute side, I was preparing my teams about how they were gonna cope with patient numbers, how we were gonna do things differently, at that moment in time, I can hand on heart say I never for one minute thought about how I would prepare a workforce that couldn't be in that acute area and couldn't be on that front line. So now reflecting back and reflecting back on some of the conversations I've had with other managers and shielded workers themselves, I think we'll, this is a really good opportunity to capture the experiences of some people who were anticipating that pandemic, who were part of that workforce planning, but then were very suddenly told, actually, you're going to be part of that shielded community, and therefore you aren't allowed to be in that clinical area. And I, for one minute, cannot imagine what that felt like. So this is why this panel, and I'm so delighted because it must be so 
brave to come and speak about something so personal and something that can, I can only describe as being so personally challenging. So the first kind of question I want to kick off with is, what was it like being told you needed to shield? So what, getting that text message or however it happened, what was it like to actually get that? Lorna, can I come to you first, please? I think probably my overwhelming emotion was relief in the first instance, because I'd been watching the situation and I kept thinking, are we not going into lockdown? Are we not going into lockdown? Things were getting worse and worse. And although I live in a rural area, there were a lot of cases in the area that I live in. And I work in a role that's got a lot of aerosol generating procedures. And I couldn't see how I was going to be safe. And I hadn't been told that I couldn't go, in, no, I hadn't go into work. And I'd actually had a conversation with my manager the week before we went officially into lockdown and shielding and said, there are, there are just things that I'm doing that I don't feel safe. Um, you know, we're phoning patients and finding out if they had symptoms, etc. But we knew that asymptomatic patients could be coming in with the, with the virus. And, and she agreed that, you know, I could, I could sort of work around things and try and do things by phone. But when the actual text arrived... I thought, right, that's it. Okay, good. I have, I have a reason now to be at home and to work from home. And I felt overwhelming relief. And then reality set in a bit because I thought, okay, so how am I going to do this? And actually, I'm going to have to do this all on my own because um, my partner lives away in Scotland. My grown-up children were around. And I thought, if, if they live with me, then it's an increased risk to me and I'm going to be severely risk, um, restricting their lives. So we kind of made the decision between us that they wouldn't live with me. So I thought, well, that's it. I've now got at least 12 weeks, and it's turned out to be a lot longer than that, living entirely on my own and trying to do this job, which is, you know, it's quite a hard job. And then I kind of went into overdrive a bit for the first couple of weeks. I think it was partly anxiety driving it, because I thought... If I can get my first two weeks in without developing any symptoms, the first 14 days in without developing any symptoms, I'll be okay. So that was kind of driving everything. Um, and then everything that had to be, because everything was changing so quickly, I sort of, I ended up taking on the role of, of monitoring everything that was coming on Twitter about all the changes and just sort of firing off all these emails. And I don't know whether people wanted them or not, but they were getting them. Um, and then doing all the stuff we had to do to try and protect the patients um, because the service I've got involves people having a drop-in service and I thought we can't have them doing that. And I was just working ridiculous hours to start with um, until I calmed down a little bit, really. Yeah. So that, that relief decision, Megan, but then that overload, that overdrive, I suppose in the, in the, in the acute situation, that is a little bit of panic, isn't it? It's like you know, they're going, addressing something at 100 miles an hour, that's new. Did anyone else want to come in there? Have any um, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think my situation echoes Lorna's that um, I went into overdrive and for me, the, it was guilt. I felt guilty that I wasn't out there doing the job I've spent the last 18 years training to do. Um, and that week before I got the shielding letter, I was on station. And I, as, it, as that week unfolded, um, I, I felt more and more vulnerable thinking about my colleagues are going out on jobs, even though I'm not, in, I'm not going face to face with the patient. They're going in and out of this building, seeing goodness knows what, and then bringing it back to me. Uh, and that kind of dawning realisation that actually this, this isn't a safe place to be either. Um, so I, I don't think I felt relief when I got the letter um, initially, but I think in hindsight, I think I would have probably carried on practicing if I had not been going to the office if I hadn't received that letter. So I think that was probably the safest thing to have happened for me. Um, but then that period of probably two, three weeks afterwards of being complete overdrive, working 10 hours a day, trying to get myself involved in some way to prove that I was being useful and helpful to um, try and compensate in myself that guilty feeling that I had all, that all my colleagues are out there feeling just as vulnerable and just as, just as at risk as I am, because um, we don't know who will be affected by COVID really. Um, and, and yeah, and that guilt has, I think the guilt is wearing off now. I think I feel like I have been useful. I've done as much as I can during this period. Um, but um, part of me will always wish I, I should have been on the front line where I belong, I suppose. 
Yes, I think it's that sense of belonging, isn't it? And I think, obviously, for those that work in quite an isolated role, um, you know, as part of, like, a single team or just because of the nature of their job, maybe found the transition easier to coming out of that whole team, very close-knit environment. But actually, it was the it was compensating for their what they felt was a value to the service or to the patient. And I think there's been, I think sometimes there's a tendency to um, not under-recognise the importance of all of the other added added tasks and added values that are given to achieve an end result. Um, certainly as you get higher up the management chain, you realise how much goes on under the surface. When you're that frontline clinician, sometimes it's just about going to work, seeing the patients, getting the job done, going home. And I think that is some of the shielded work, as it said back to me, is the shielded worker you could never switch off. And that's what you were saying to your staff. You were saying, go to work, do your eight hours, do your 10 hours, do your 12 hours, but you go home, you don't answer emails, you don't do any policy writing, you don't do any, let me do that. But because of that, the shielded workers were then taking everything on. So like you said, Sasha, working eight hour days would then be 10 hour days, would then be 12 hour days. But the recognition for that just didn't follow suit. Kat, can I come to you, please? Yeah, something that Sasha said that really struck sort of a chord with me is that wanting to help. I think we come into healthcare because we want to help. The nature of who we are is because we want to help people. For me, in those very, very early days, I share that guilt, Sasha. I feel that too. It was also everything around you was all about the NHS, how under pressure it was, how, you know, the stories in the news were about, you know, the Italian doctors falling asleep on the computer, that everywhere you turned, it was the NHS is under pressure and to be sat at home and not being able to help your colleagues you know you're right you work as part of a team no single one of us works in isolation even if your role is isolated you still link in with the team and for me being surrounded by the NHS is in crisis we need all the help we're pulling people out of retirement and I'm sat at home and I can't help was just a horrible sick to the stomach sort of feeling of sort of helplessness in a way that I've not felt before because I just the one time the NHS that I've given my career to needed me, I wasn't there. And that was horrible. I, I think I cried when I first was told. Yeah, me too. <laughs> There's lots of nodding there for the audio people that there, um, lots of agreement in terms of self. So I think some people as well describe this kind of almost, like you've mentioned emotion, but almost like a sense of grief as well, being detached from something. And it was without any sense of warning, any sense of a lot of shielded workers just didn't put two and two together because of a condition that they had or because of something that happened to them in the past, which then put them into a vulnerable group that they had never thought themselves to be in. Um, and it, there was no preparation time for that. Some of the staff that had, you know, that could be mobilised from an IT perspective, so some tips were really quick about giving things like remote access and giving emails at home and on iPhones and laptops. Again, that sense of purpose happened really quickly. But then there was staff that were just left. They were just like left in terms of, okay, you're shielded, go home, you're safe. The manager thinks they don't have to worry about you their focus is on acute so then you have this person left at home and again there might be some managers at home listening to things think oh my god I done that you know I was I sent them home and I thought they're safe they're with their family or you know we'll give them some menial tasks to do or we'll give them some policies and protocols to look over um but maybe didn't do the phone checking in maybe just didn't say can we schedule a catch-up once a week twice a week can we just have this kind of like touch base session? So that moves us on to kind of support and what support and then what, what maybe wasn't very good support, what was good support. And I think I have to re-emphasize at this point that this isn't a criticism of managers or teams or services. This is the realities of living through a pandemic when a focus is on the front line, the focus is on the critical care, you know, the emergency services, the emergency departments, and then the respiratory wards because it's a respiratory virus. But actually now is the time to reflect and think, and if we were, heaven forbid, ever to go through this again and we had shielded workers, how could we better prepare as managers and leaders for this, for this um, situation? 
So I am going to come down to, who am I going to? Um, Ross, can I come to you? In terms of how, what kind of support did you, did you get? You're a band five, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Quite, I mean, I don't think I've, I've spoken to many band fives that were shielded actually, and you're in a slightly different um, situation, aren't you? In the fact that, in the fact that maybe you don't, you're ninety five percent clinical, so yeah, you maybe I've, don't yeah. have other responsibilities that say the sixes and the sevens do. So tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think because all I, I haven't been practicing that long, and all I have done is clinical. Um, and maybe because I'm quite a small fish in a big pond, all of those other roles and, and jobs and stuff were just attributed to people higher up. Um, so I, I haven't really been doing anything, to be honest. Um, the support has been okay from like a colleague perspective. Like lots of people have, you know, checked in and messaged and sort of asked how I was and things like that. But um, like on a friendship basis, but I haven't really had any contact with. My managers, I don't know what's um, what's happening. I was contacted initially about doing um, being put forward for the track and trace role, um, but because I moved back Eng back to England, um, I wasn't able to do it for NHS Wales, so um, that never came to fruition. But that that's the only contact I had really, and that was about six seven weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I haven't really haven't been doing much to be honest. So I think you've just made you've, that. That's a really, you know, powerful point there, Ross, about the difference between colleagues reaching out uh, in a friendship type capacity to actually your manager. And managers are busy. I mean, they're always busy. But I suppose it's the importance and the priorities that were placed on people, um, and that includes the staff. Um, and again, there's kind of no excuse for it and it's recognising it now on hindsight, but you're not alone in that thought. And I think sometimes just having that reach out and, you know, sometimes looking at other skills that people have. So it's not just clinical skills, it's other skills you might have in IT or, you know, communication or looking at patient facing information. Um, you know, I think that is look, thinking about other things that we can make people feel part of a team that they're suddenly being completely detached from because you know also have the social isolation you then have the isolation from your team as well yeah yeah um lorna can i come to you next please yep i think probably um one of the things i found is that i felt quite disconnected from from the from my colleagues um and i work in two different teams and a lot of the time i didn't really know what was going on apart from with my very small part of of work um and i'd be getting you know i sometimes got copied into emails and sometimes i didn't get copied into emails um one team was choosing not to have meetings because they had too many other priorities the other team was having meetings but in a way that they were all meeting in a room and I was trying to link in, but I couldn't hear what was being said. Um, and I'm not known for being backwards at coming forwards in my opinions. I'm a bit, I can be a bit of a bullshit get really. But I realised it's been a really useful exercise in just trying to reflect on how things have been. And I didn't say, I didn't sort of complain. I didn't sort of, and I thought, why, why did I not complain? And I think it was two reasons. One, one was, it felt a bit churlish to be complaining um, that I, me sitting at home, being safe, wasn't being included and wasn't, it's sort of because they were the people out there sort of on the front line or working in roles where they're coming in contact with the virus. And it just, it was that guilt thing again. It's been the kind of overriding emotion all the way through is guilt that I think I'm doing a good job clinically from home, but I'm not there. Um, I'm not in the sort of leadership role that I normally would be actually on the ground. And I think the other thing is that I, I didn't really let myself think about it. I'm not really somebody who does mindfulness. It kind of doesn't really work for me. But I think essentially it could be so overwhelming. Everything that was happening could be so overwhelming that I kind of, if it felt like it was coming overwhelming and I was thinking, I don't know what's happening. And I think, no, just bring it back. 
put it in a box, just get through the next hour, the next day, the next week, whatever. Um, which is fine, but just why I, I'm never quite so sure about mindfulness because it's got to get dealt with somehow. And this is one way of helping, <laughs> really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I completely hear what you're saying. And uh, I think, I, again, I can't imagine being in a, this, your situation, any of your situations at all. But I, you know, I mentioned at the beginning when we were having a chat before we started recording about my predominant role always be very clinical. And then I moved into this management role. And the first day I had at home, I'm sat in Newcastle now, you know, I was like, oh my God, this, I feel so guilty. Like, my team didn't need us to be there they didn't need us to be you know they were absolutely fine but it was me and I thought god if I feel this after one day what are people feeling like when it's been like that for four months so again I I, I, I hear what you're saying and it's a very raw emotion isn't it it's, and it's something that you can't really prepare yourself for now there is yep yeah, Kath can I come to you I was just thinking something you sort of mentioned earlier sort of what in that time you knew your colleagues were really busy so you tried to, and I, I completely agree Lorna that churlish word is exactly how I felt sort of I, I wanted to get in touch and I was sort of chasing them with emails and I know I was a complete pest of like is there anything you can get I can do for you anything I can do any projects you can do anything I can help with I was on the Twitter as well as someone else said you know sending them any of the research anything coming out of the latest dysphagia from London I was sending it on and I was getting nothing back and there was part of me that was feeling really quite put out that I wasn't getting a reply, but the other half of me knew it's because my colleagues were so busy. And it was that kind of, your head was caught in the middle of, I'm feeling really silly, I'm feeling so sad that everyone's not talking to me, but then knowing it's because they're really busy and they haven't got the time. Um, and it was how you sort of learned to live with that feeling in those early days, because you understood, you never felt, you know, guilt that your colleague, you know, for your colleagues that they, you know, that they were not going to be replying. There was no sort of, bad feeling towards them because you knew what it was like but you did also feel a bit left out um, and you, you you just couldn't there wasn't a comfortable place to be I think it's probably the easiest way to describe it thank you now Lauren I'm going to come down to you as another relatively newish member of our workforce and you know tell me about a positive um, experience that you've had something that where you have felt supported by your team as a shielded worker um, so, well, initially then, when I first got told to go home to Shield, I was kind of the same. I was split between two rotations. So I was doing outpatient paediatrics and also doing um, a medical team split. So um, I came home and to start with, it was kind of the non-clinical duties I was doing. So any like patient leaflets for COVID or anything to help with like signposting um like older people for like food and supermarket resources back when we couldn't get any essential um food supplies and so that was kind of for the first couple of months and so i was kind of in between teams so i had a lot of support from existing teams even though i wasn't there so su supervisors like checking in um asking how i was doing um and if I'd be transferred or what kind of support I was getting. And then I moved to another group, like a non-clinician group. So we were all set up in a group chat and we kind of had regular um, weekly sort of meetings. So everybody just checking in, the people working from home um, in the different departments who were kind of sharing experiences or things that have been difficult that week, um, which was just really nice to just check in with other people that were feeling the same way, um, which was really encouraging and um yeah so this the support has been amazing and then i was fortunate enough to um be transferred so i think they were looking at the csp for physio the union and there wasn't much guidance for band fives like myself and they they basically said what seemed sensible was to transfer me from my rotation to a msk based one so i could try and do it virtually like all the other physios so I've been doing that now for the last couple of months and although the technology has been really tricky um, to have like video access because I haven't still got a trust laptop because they've been inundated with the amount of requests I've just been doing telephone um, patient consultations which that's just been really nice in itself to be sort of gradually phased back to clinical working when you've been out for so many sort of months and especially as a newly qualified physio, like I just completed my first rotation and got all of these clinical skills and was respiratory trained and ready to go 
on the front line and doing on call. So then to come away and be told you have to do non-clinical now, that was a bit of a shock to the system. And I was alongside you guys feeling guilty because obviously I was trained up ready to do that sort of thing with respiratory patients. And then having to come back and to just take a more backseated approach was, was quite tricky. Um, but I think just reflecting now back on what I was given non-clinical task wise, it was, um, it, at the time I didn't really feel like it was of much value and I was contributing. I think a lot of our members felt like that because we weren't having an impact directly. But um, now that our service, our MSK service has opened back up to have produced like online resources for like leaflets and signposting patients, it's, it's been really positive from that aspect to have the support to have done that. So that's been really good. Thank you. Now I'm going to come to Sasha then. Charlotte, I'm coming down to you. So Sasha, can you give us a little bit of insight into what support you found really helpful? Um, well, I think I've been really lucky being a, because I'm a band six research paramedic, I kind of span two departments, so clinical and research. So I got support from two parts of my organisation. Um, so when one didn't have much for me to do, there was always something the other department had something for me to, to do. So um, uh, my experience has been really positive. It's also um, the, the kind of extra time that I've had um, enabled me to set up our clinical supervision policy. Uh, and we've been able to offer remote clinical supervision throughout the pandemic to enable people to discuss their anxieties and kind of bring to the table any um, particular issues that they've had in a safe environment. So. Um, that's been the ideal opportunity to employ um, clinical supervision. Um, so, uh, and we'd, we we've set up particular um, groups for our shielding staff to enable them to talk. Uh, that's been a more recent thing, as I think when we got to the, the twelve week mark, we started thinking, well, actually, what are these people doing? And I think um, our, our experiences has been the same as everybody saying here, same with Ross. So. We're finding that our, um, our emergency care assistance staff who aren't um, um, qualified as paramedics, uh, they've been kind of left to their own devices because we haven't been able to give them something to do. Where our paramedics have been doing um, remote clinical validation and kind of supporting the, the road staff um, via telephone. So that's been really useful and enabled them to feel valued. Um, but there have been groups of staff who are feeling less valued and probably have not been as well supported as others. It's been a bit of a mixed bag for everybody, I think. Absolutely, and hopefully one of the things that will come from this is about trying to get that quality of whatever in this situation again. So Charlotte, can you share some of your experience? Please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I was saying earlier, I've been office based through this. Um, so the support from my team has been absolutely amazing. I couldn't fault it one little bit, thankfully. Um, I know that there has been some horror stories out there. Um, a lot of my role, because I'm in the respiratory team normally, I've done a lot of the training for the um, redeployed staff into our team. Um, I've been the support of them. People have made jokes that they think I've got trackers on them because <laughs> I know what's going on with everybody throughout the hospital, really. Um, keeping a track on what's going on with the patients. Um, but me being able to do that role, it's enabled the clinical staff or Obviously, I was clinical staff, but um, the people who are still able to work clinical to do their job and it's taken the pressure off them. It's taken the pressure off the clinical lead to be able to do her job to the best of her ability without having to worry about the training side of things. As part of my normal role, I would do training for the on-call staff and the uh, other physio teams and some of the nurses. So it's not an abnormal that I'm doing that, but it's definitely helped take the pressure off her that I could take the lead with that and she didn't have to think about it um, and having somebody always available for them to come and ask questions to um, without when they're up on ICU with all the PP on they can't be answering the bleep so kind of bleep holders caseload management things like that that's been um, really helpful and they've let me know that that's been helpful which is what I needed um, when you're sat in the office and they're up on the wards, like everybody said, there's definitely that guilt there and it, it's horrible. Um, there's a relief and I, I suppose everybody else will probably think this, that um, your family are definitely more relieved that you're not in on the front line. But when, as a senior member of a team, when say a flu patient is usually on ICU, 
the senior team tend to go in there rather than leaving the juniors because you feel like that's what you should do. You should, you should take the lead. You should put yourself at risk more. Don't get me wrong with the PPE and everything. We've got all of those flu jabs. But that's the problem with this. When it first started and we had query COVID, um, I was the first one to be putting myself into that room with that patient to assess them. And when you're told that, no, you can't do that anymore, it's, ve it's a very uncomfortable feeling. So I just want to pick up on a couple of things there. So you've mentioned a couple of times it's really important you got that feedback. So do you think your experience has been generally really positive because your A had a role that you could identify with that was like part of your normal role? So you already you already knew you had that self like awareness that you were good at that job. Then you just translated that job into a more like um, like office based, as you called it, um, role. But then on top of that, you had your team feeding back to you that you were doing a great job and you were so helpful and they were so appreciative. And that constant reinforcement then meant that, you know, you felt valued because it's this word value that people keep coming back to me and saying when I say, what, how did you feel? They said, I just didn't feel valued. I had no value. I had no worth. So is that, does that kind of make sense to you? Yeah, wholeheartedly. And it's what you need to hear, rather than um, feeling that you're a hindrance or you're, you're not helping because you're not able to do what you normally would do. Um, yeah, it, it, I've definitely felt valued through this. So for the people that maybe didn't feel valued on the panel, or maybe people who didn't have that, reinforcement and let's face it there's some managers out there who just will never give some staff that reinforcement and acknowledgement regardless of pandemic or not like I'm not going to say here yeah, and everyone every manager is really good because they're not um but ha what ha what ways did you personally get over that if you have like did you give yourself targets did you start to uh, acknowledge in other ways of how your contribution was meaningful like how did anyone get around that how did they give themselves value some people are still struggling with this right now out there anyone got any tips Lorna I think it's uh, I think it's looking at the whole picture really so whatever it is that you're doing is going to be of value to somebody. It's just, I think a lot of the time, what we're doing is valued, but we just don't, we don't allow ourselves to think it's valuable. I mean, I've been, I've been managing to carry on seeing practically all my voice caseload throughout this and, and some of my head and neck caseload. And the thing that's really kept me going is that the patients are so appreciative. I'm there, I'm at the end of a, of a, of a video link. Um, but I think it's, despite the fact that that's there, it feels a bit like being in a bubble in a, in a slight vacuum that you don't really know what kind of impact that's having outside of the, outside of what the actual sort of patient interaction. Um, and I think maybe that's, that's part of what I was, I was missing because it, it just, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Um, a, bit, a bit more feedback really. I said, at, at one point, I did get an, an email because um, we're trying to sort of push things forward for the post-COVID patients with voice problems. So hooray, I'm finally getting involved with COVID patients. Um, and I got a really lovely email from my ENT consultant sort of saying he thought I'd been acting very professionally and I'd shown great leadership, etc. And I thought, have I? Really? Is that what people think? Because I don't know that. I don't know whether that's true or not. And, and I think you get so down on yourself particularly the higher up the tree you get when you feel you're not there doing your, your job that, you know, maybe we just need to be a bit kinder to ourselves. So I think, yeah, Kat, I'll come to you. I think that's really important there about, about feedback. So I want to say everyone, to everyone that's listening to this session that if you're not getting that feedback from your manager, even at this stage right now, ask them for it. Ask them the question, has what I've been doing added value? Has this been appreciated? Has, what has this meant to you? 
just ask the question and I think that's really easy for me to say and ask it with confidence but that's your right to do that as as that is part of that team is that employee it's your right to say can I have some feedback about what I've been doing for the last four months and you know and hopefully you'll get some positive recognition for what you've been doing and also some feedback as well Kat can I come to you please I obviously many of you have read my blog um, where I wrote very personally about how it had felt to be at home and actually that's writing that wasn't written for anyone else it was written semi-anonymously initially and it was the comms team sort of where I work that said you're actually speaking for other people here and by sharing that I actually for the first time felt I get gained value because I heard from other people saying yeah you've just said what I was thinking but I felt guilty for it and I think to people listening to this if you're sat there at home nodding your head thinking yeah 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 this is me you're talking about me I think you're right, Rachel, we have to be kind to ourselves and say it's okay to feel like that because I think that's a big part of being at home. It takes guts to ask your manager for feedback and yes, we should all be able to, but that doesn't always happen and there are those many reasons that you can't ask or you ask and you don't get what you need. For me, I didn't need to hear from my manager that I'd been valued because the stuff that I was doing didn't mean, wasn't valuable to me. Writing a policy wasn't valuable to me. It didn't add any value. I, I know I've worked long enough to know a policy is the structure behind what we do, what we do, but it wasn't value. Where I suddenly felt valued was when I was felt I was helping other people. Um, and that comes back to my intrinsic reason for coming into healthcare, for helping other people. And my blog enabled me to help others. I got people when it went out internally getting in touch saying thank you. That gave me value. And I think for you know, I think there is something to be said for those at home. Be kind to yourself if you're feeling like this and if you don't get that feedback that's okay because you you will have done something even if it is just protecting yourself from becoming a patient for your colleagues that's that's value you don't have to get that feedback so the, this is really simple stuff eh this is just about being human and having empathy and recognizing um people who are working just in a different way and not forgetting so again it's a message out there to say remember that all of your team the ones that are that present the ones that are working remotely um you know i think that that's a really strong message that's coming through from everyone and just recognizing and like you said you don't want whistles and balloons and it's just a sometimes a simple message to say thank you or that feedback or the acknowledgement um and sometimes that might be really hard if you haven't got an outcome-based task or if you've not got a clinical workload, like, for example, Ross, um, much harder. But then we'll have Lauren who was redeployed into an area where she could have been more productive and more efficient. So there is lots of different workarounds, isn't there, in terms of what you can do and how you can achieve that. So there's a couple of areas I want to um, bring in here, and it's around kind of what worked well, what do we need to learn from? If history was to repeat itself, heaven forbid, in our lifetime, what, how can we be better prepared for that? So even thinking from a very um, operational phase, so, and Ross, Lauren, you maybe want to think about the new grads in this, the rotational staff, um, and for the rest of you, maybe think about um, digital technology, like even having access to stuff at home. Now, normally that's all been because of data protection and firewalls and things like that. But do we need to make sure from now our workforce can flex across being in a hospital, being at home? Do we need more flexible work and do we need accessible IT systems? Do we need to have um, understand our workforce and what transferable skills people have? What do people think? Lorna. I think probably one of the most amazing things about this pandemic, although it's been horrendous in so many ways, is that across the NHS it would appear that whereas we would normally have a meeting about a meeting about a meeting about a meeting and then we get something done, things have just happened. Things that would never have happened for months, if not years, have just happened. So, I and mean, I can't praise our IT service enough. I mean, I had a, a remote access up and running within a week of starting shielding. I saw my first patient within a week of starting shielding. Um, 
and there's so many of those things that are going to carry on and be really useful um, whether we've got a pandemic or not in terms of how we work um, for people having access. Um, so if, if one department can do it, all departments can do it. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of shown that things can be done and I'm really hoping we don't go back to the, to the point where we have endless meetings for getting things done again. And it's that word permission, isn't it? Yeah. So you don't have to seek permission from multiple people. If you've got an idea, you've got a way in doing it. You can, as long as it's safe, you've got governance around it, you can just crack on and implement for sure. Yeah. Anyone else have got um, cats yet? I think you've said the point, the technology has changed and the sort of transferable skills. I mean, that's a phrase that when you're a student, you feel like you're beaten around the head 10 hundred times by. But actually, the pandemic really showed that we do have transferable skills. And I think things like sort of, you know, seeing patients remotely before it was always no, 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 patients have got to come in. They like the face to face contact. We can't do that. Actually, I, I started sort of a bit like Lauren. I started taking on some remote clinics latterly. Um, I got feedback from patients. They loved it. They didn't have to try and get into hospital. They didn't have to try and find parking. They didn't have to walk the length of the hospital to get to the clinic room. They felt they actually, one patient fed back, she said, I feel like you've got more time for me, um, which was really lovely to hear. And I think is a message that we probably want to take forward because if this suddenly happened again next week, a lot of those clinics haven't come back face to face. But I think what might need to change if it's to happen again is how can the workforce at home be redeployed to do those clinics? Um, so it's not necessarily the people who are shielding who are doing some of those clinics now, but could we? Um, I don't know, but I think some of them, more of them probably than we think, could be covered by some of us who are at home. And it's just about, so we might need a little bit of upskilling to do some of the things, but could we hold the fort while everyone else is fighting fires on site? Possibly. I think, we, you know, I think it's a question to be asked. I think it shouldn't be assumed, no, because it certainly has shown that, you know, technology has changed the way clinics are working without a yeah. shadow of it. I think that's definitely one thing and it's like a mixture of services like you said and the key thing for me just listening to you all is understanding your workforce and understanding what the workforce when it adapts and changes what can also adapt and change and comes with that and sometimes given the emphasis on people to say what can your contribution like Sasha explained you know what what are the skills or what other things can you bring which can be done remotely and like Lorna said being given permission for that and it's a lot, lot around being kind. Now, again, I mentioned before that some of the, when people have reached out to talk to me in preparation for this, um, this podcast, um, I've heard some really sad stories, actually. We don't want to concentrate too much on the negatives, but one of the things I want to get across, especially for the more managers, are actually the clinic, clinicians and the colleagues, is about being kind. So Charlotte described such a, a lovely experience that she's had because her colleagues were kind and understood and included her. And that's not always the case. And I've spoken to two team leads um, from completely, you know, other ends of the country. And they are almost feeling completely isolated from their team because they haven't been on the front line, you know, that word that we use. They haven't, they, they, you know, their teams have told them they don't understand what they've been through. Their teams are saying, you know, asking, putting unrealistic expectations on them in terms of teaching or requests or almost like manipulating the situation so they can make changes in the team that aren't maybe necessarily right. So one of the things I wanted to get across on their behalf, and if you are that team lead who's been shielding, there are other people that are feeling like that and that's not right. And what we have to understand collectively together is how we can appreciate and understand everyone's added value in this pandemic because nobody who's in a clinical role ever wants to shy away from that nobody wants to not be there when you're a team leader you don't want to not be leading your team but the everything everyone's described here about those feelings and those emotions that people have when they can't be in the mix with their team physically there then we just need to be mindful of that because the the trauma that people will be going through sat at home um, will be significant and then you don't know what else is going on there might be with other vulnerable people in the household they might have not be able to see their vulnerable parents or their vulnerable others like Lorna explained to me the decision about not completely distancing herself from her family so then on top of that if you've got a team who are 
you know, maybe not having that compassionate side because why should they do that for their team leader? You know, they're the boss. I think that's an important point to get across as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Now, the other thing that really came up strongly um, in the conversations I was having with people is the collapse for carers. And there was a few people, a lot of people actually, not just a few, that felt guilty for the clap for carers and they felt they didn't deserve the clap. And they, there was also the, a lot of the same people felt about like the any the goodies and the discounts and um a lot like some of the teams were like, oh, we saved you a whatever was donated, a cupcake, we saved you some hand cream. And they were saying, no, no, you keep that. I don't deserve that. That's not for me. That's for you. So I just wanted to see if anyone has experience that anyone went through that emotion. I mean, obviously the, the reaction is, of course you deserve it. You are contributing, you are valued, you are part of the carers, but they really didn't feel that. Anyone, Kat, I think, did you mention this in your blog, Kat, or do you want to chip in there? I did. I mean, that first clap for carers was emotional for, I think, everyone in the NHS, but I certainly didn't feel it was for me. Um, and that's sort of something that came out. What what I would say is people, and something that surprised me, but I kind of do understand it. When I put my blog out and said that I'd felt that way, I've had people who are non-clinical getting back in touch saying they felt the same way and they felt guilty taking the, the freebies being offered because they said, you know, it felt like it was being donated for frontline staff because that's all you heard about in the news and that's what everyone was raising money for but they didn't feel they were worthy either. And that was quite interesting to hear. And I, could, I can completely see why they felt that way. But I hadn't ever, in my mind, I'd never even, when I said that, I, I wrote it from a clinician point of view, but actually it makes perfect sense that they felt that way as well. I was surprised, but it makes sense. Okay, so playing on the other side then, is there anyone who, you know, the clap for carers and thought, yeah, I deserve that, this is for me. Did, did anyone feel really included? Lorna? Happened to you? I didn't to start with. I had the same emotional reaction to start with um, of thinking this this isn't for me and you know I'm clapping for everybody else but it's not for me. But I think as as time went on it it was the fact that I, mean, I was on Twitter and Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists every Thursday would say you know let's clap for the speech and language therapists helping patients with COVID-19 and I thought absolutely absolutely everybody who is out there in horrible PPE doing all the all the things we have to do absolutely deserve a clap but actually I'm working really really hard at home and I'm seeing all these patients who are still there and they're you know the vast majority of all our case loads were non-COVID patients and we were working in really difficult circumstances to try and keep services going so I ended up emailing them and saying could you make it a little bit more inclusive? Could you just, could you make it for, for everybody? And absolutely to the credit, the next week they did, they changed it and it made it for all speech and language therapists who are out there sort of working hard in this. And I thought, thank you, thank you for that. I just a bit of acknowledgement that all of your members are working really hard was really nice. So Kat, Kat's just going to slide and clap there on the, on the video, Kat, just for people's benefit. So Lorna, but that is a great example of like compassionate leadership and actually recognizing something that you know there's, there's a lot of talk about what where the professional organization's role is and things like this and it's an advisory group you know people don't even have to be part of that professional organization if they don't want to they just need to be HCPC regulated but actually they, they just people just don't think about this kind of thing Lorna don't they not they and the feedback that we can give as clinicians to our professional organisations in a really adult and professional way is really valued by them. So you just reaching out and saying, actually, this is the wrong word in here. Please, can you change it? And it's done. That to me is like is, is leadership and action, isn't it? And this is the thing about, like I mentioned, feedback. So if you're feeling like this right now at this stage in the pandemic, that you're not getting that support from your managers, then it's you know go to them and approach them and say actually and some of the learning points um that everyone give you in terms of how it could maybe like be better um now we're going to talk about reintegration back into work next um and again i'm going to ask everyone for their lessons learned in terms of what we could do better for next time so everyone still have their thinking hats on 
But I really hadn't thought about reintegration until I started to do research for this podcast. And by that, I mean, how are we going to get workforce back into clinical areas? Do we need phased returns? Do we need, we've got individual risk assessments to do in each organisation now, which should protect staff way more than pre-COVID, because like you said, Sasha, we didn't know what COVID, how it was going to affect healthcare workers and patients. Um, but... I, can't, I mean, Kat and Charlotte, you're both in uniforms now. Um, and I know some of you have got plans to go back, but some of you haven't. Um, Ross, if I can come to you, is there anything that kind of sticks out in your mind about what reintegration would look like back into clinical activity? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I know that where I work, they've got so, so set of some green zones um so where they're sort of covid secure um so i guess that would be the kind of way in but i'm not really sure when that's going to happen um i think shielding in wales ends on like the 16th of august so obviously i'd really like to be back on the 17th but i, I don't know how realistic that is um my worry is that as soon as there's the first sniff of anything again if there's a second wave in the winter or anything like that it's just going to be the same process um which is it's just good for like a you know your individual health and stuff but i don't really want to just be locked away again for another you know however many weeks um so to be honest i, I don't really know what it's going to look like yeah <laughs> so i think for the for the rosters of the world i think what we're what we really need to think about then to anyone that manages the ross of the world then i think it's it's again understanding what the Ross's, um, you know, skills are and contribution and le doing that before the next pandemic hits or before we have a second surge, like you said, or when they're actually going out, managers going out of their way to their shielded workers, say, okay, what could we do differently? What, what value, what, what, what could you bring knowing now what you know as well? So to having that two-week conversation for sure. Um, does anyone else want to come in there in terms of what what reintegration might look, Lauren? And like, Lauren, then I'll come to Sasha. Um, so I haven't got a definitive plan in place yet, but I have got a meeting with my supervisor coming up. So I do understand the general process of what they're trying to implement. So it's kind of an individual risk assessment, like you said, to sort of screen um, and they're putting me in the MSK outpatient department as they've um, seen that that's obviously the lowest kind of risk um, at the moment for me to be placed. And then um, other colleagues who've already completed their risk assessment and spoken to their supervisor. So they're doing a graded return. So sort of doing a couple of days to see how it first sort of goes and then sort of a phased return from there, which I think I'll probably go down the same sort of route start with because it will still be quite a lot of lone working I think from like a cubicle perspective even though you'll see colleagues it'll be at like um, arm's length and I live in a house share so um, if I'm lone working in the hospital if I come home and obviously restrictions have eased and the house is quite busy I wouldn't want to then have to come home and be lone working there so I think it will be a good approach to sort of do a graded return anyway um, and then it will take a couple of weeks to sort of find your feet with PPE and all the different measures that have been put in place that you've not been really aware of that everybody else has just been doing sort of second nature so yeah yeah and I think for some people I'm hearing it's the anxieties even in public transport you know particularly if I think about London and Birmingham places like that it's um, the real anxiety about how you're physically going to get to work as well and um, Sasha um, so my workplace, I think, uh, have been amazing, and we're currently mapping or um, asking all our departments have uh, um, to map all their remote jobs. So is there anything that could be done in your department remotely, and then we'll be able to have a list of things available for staff going forward who will need to work from home for whatever reason? And so being really proactive. Um, but for my own personal circumstances, I'm on immunosuppressant therapy, which I potentially would have finished by now if it wasn't for the pandemic. But I can't finish it until after the pandemic. 
Um, and so I'm left in a situation where um, I'm not going to be able to do my job. That uh, My consultant says that um, I would be able to work in an environment where the patient has been tested and they have confirmed not to have COVID and they are asymptomatic. As a frontline paramedic, that's not something I'm going to be able to achieve. Um, so where that leaves me in my career going forwards, I'm currently in a research role, so that's okay for now. But if this goes on for another year, another two years, um, what does that mean for my career? I, I don't know. And it's that uncertainty, isn't it, Sasha, that then all of the other emotions and experiences that you've had as shielders workers then add in an uncertainty. And like you said, Ross, that fear and uncertainty is, is this going to happen again? You know, the government keeps telling us there's going to be a second surge, just if not when, and we are planning for a different kind of surge in winter. We're planning for a bad winter. So again, the rules around winter might change. Um, I, I get it completely. So um, what I really wanted to do was, and these are, for, these are specifically for the people who have reached out who are still really struggling, has anyone got any advice for people who are still in that very acute kind of emotional state about guilt and about detachment and isolation and feeling really devalued? And has anyone got any tips for them on how, you know, how they can get Sasha? I mean, certainly for my workplace, I think the biggest thing that they've come back to the shielded workers was don't feel guilty. Um, we, they've been busy, but they've not been overwhelmed, touch wood, as yet, um, that we, they've coped. And yes, we are missed, but we are not currently needed. Um, so it's uh, so just bearing that in mind that, you know, the news reports of, you know, nobody be able to cope and we're not able to answer 999 calls. That hasn't happened. We have managed to cope. We have answered 999 calls. Everybody has received the emergency and urgent care that they've needed. Um, so bearing that, you know, so the guilt, Yes, you actually might feel guilty, but you don't need to from an organisational perspective. Um, and just going forward, just be kind to yourself and give yourself a break because it's OK to be at home. It's OK to feel all right about it. Um, it's OK to feel guilty about it. Whatever your emotions are, it's OK because these are really strange times. And I um, was part of a meeting this morning uh, and um, uh, the kind of outcome of that was that we are all in the same storm. We just have different size boats. <laughs> uh, and so everybody is going to be affected by this, whether you're on the front line, whether you're in ICU, whether you're on, you, uh, on your own at home with nothing to do, uh, everybody's being affected. So just be kind to each other and be empathetic for everybody else's scenarios. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you, Sasha. And that's a massive shout out to all of our paramedic colleagues as well. Um, who've had such a turbulent time, PPE, you know, we've lost some paramedics as well. So that's just a massive shout out to everyone from from our paramedic community. Um, who would like Kat? Can I come to you, and then I'll come to Lorna. Thanks. I think in answer to your question, for the person sat at home still feeling very very isolated, if you can, I would suggest reaching out to someone. For me, sharing my blog with my manager was a game changer in that it just got us talking um, in a way we probably hadn't before. But also, it then started just little things like being involved in the morning huddle um, or sort of team sort of discussions via teams was a really nice way for me to feel sort of more integrated into what was going on in the team you got a bit more of the morning banter you got an idea of what kind of patients they were doing and it was a really non-threatening way of reintegrating back with my team and like just getting my face sort of known again even though it was in a screen like this um, it was just a gentle way to get back in because I know it's it was very hard having been on the outside to feel like I didn't want to be confrontational coming in and I didn't know how it was going to be. And it was, it was hard, but reaching out and making that first contact is sometimes all it takes um, to sort of start getting people to think, remember to include you. And sort of, as I say, the teams just joining in for five minutes in the morning of just hearing them discuss triaging patients was enough to get me feeling a little less isolated and a little more part of the team. And then things started to Sort of move from there i mean I, I might have been lucky but if you're on your own at home reach out to somebody because my experience has been you you won't be alone in how you're feeling because the feeling of guilt actually is across the nhs from people who've been working that's the feedback i've heard from people who have work, been working in the hospital but not doing the frontline stuff there's been guilt about they've not been doing the right job there'll be guilt for people who've felt they haven't managed to do enough for the patients that they were there the guilt that they can't offer the service they normally do 
guilt is massive for the NHS and you're not alone with that. That's very much what's come through when we had a team reflection. Everyone has guilt that we're not doing a good enough job because you know services are shut so you can't refer patients on you're not seeing communication patients there's always something that someone feels they haven't done enough for at the moment and it is as Sasha says be kind to yourself but, but yeah. reach out. and some of the some of the clinical staff have caught COVID and been up for a long time and there's, there's guilt associated with that as well so you're absolutely right you just don't know you don't know what someone else might be thinking or feeling or going through Lorna yeah it was just wanted to share something that I think came from the Canadian government. I think the Canadian government issued some guidelines to people who are working at home. And the one that really struck home was to say, don't think I'm working from home. Think instead, I'm at home trying to do my job to the best of my ability in really extraordinary circumstances. Because that's a different thing. And that really does let you be kind to yourself. Thank you for that. So um, I'm going to come to Charlotte, Ross and Lauren first. I want everyone to, um, to just summarise with their lesson learnt. Are there significant something that if we ever went through this again has to happen, has to change or has to be repeated? Lauren, did you want to come in and say something about that last point before we do that? Yeah, it was basically just to add on, really. So what Lorna was just saying, doing a job in exceptional circumstances. And I think my trust in particular has been, it's been great that they kind of, well, they put me forward to do this role, but they said, obviously, it's like a trial in a way, because they've never had like a band five do a virtual or anybody's done virtual consultations before. So the specialist physios already have loads of knowledge, and then you've just come straight in and doing virtual consultations from uni, you obviously have different assessment styles already in your head that you've got to change to. Um, it's just basically been a challenge. So I just, in the end, I've now put it down to the career challenge. So you're gonna always have career challenges throughout your whole journey. So obviously this isn't a norm, but um, if you've been flexible enough and taken on all the tasks that they've given you, I've just seen it in a positive light and think, well, I'll just be a bit more resilient going forwards, really. Thank you for that. So, Charlotte, can I come to you, please? Yeah. I think resilience is definitely one of the words um, going forward. And whatever you can do, trying to be part of the team, um, like Kat was saying, being involved in the MDT and that side of things, hopefully, if and when anything like this does ever happen again, it shouldn't take as long to get to the point where we're at now. Hopefully it will revert back quite quickly to supporting everybody as needed, rather than, like you said, they're at home, they're safe, we don't have to think about them. Um, people's eyes will be open a little bit more, I'm hoping, and understanding of everybody's situation, not just the frontline staff. Absolutely, hopefully. Ross? Um, I don't know, I think it's difficult because obviously like you say we've never had to do this before and I think that, um, or particularly I think that it, it's just been how it is, um, so like my situation or whatever, it's just been how it is because that's just it. Um, so I think it's difficult to come up with something to say that we've learned because I don't, I don't really know. Um, I guess maybe from like a higher up point of view, just talking to your staff a bit more maybe, uh, but equally like in the same breath, it's difficult, isn't it? Because um, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with you're at home, you're shielding, you're safe, we'd have to worry about you. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult to get a balance. And like you say, it's all new, isn't it? So it's just how it is, I guess. I, I don't know, I think it's a difficult one to answer. Thank you. Um, Lauren? I think um, like a lot of the things from the pandemic, we've all been focusing on or just been overwhelmed by what's happened. So we've all been focusing on like the negative things and you hear about all the negative things that happens like um, in the news that like, you get occasional good things. But for us, when we reflected like as a service, because obviously outpatient hasn't been up and running like it 
would be normally our case loads have been really reduced so we've been seeing like four patients a day which normally you'd probably be seeing double which has kind of given us that time to do other non-clinical work so it's also helped us to like come up with ideas for service improvement projects so we're currently undertaking like um, pilot studies to introduce new sort of services to improve it and as they said if we were continuing with our like caseload and things as normal we just wouldn't have had the time to sit down and sort of say right this is what we're going to do because it just wouldn't have been feasible so from a service development point of view it's been really good because we're currently undertaking it and from another colleague who's been shielding she's been able to help the patient flow with a new sort of ot service so just sort of thinking outside the box of how you can feel valued but also do maybe a new role might be also worth um checking in on thank you thank you very much kat i'm coming to you next and sasha van lorna so kat thank you oh um so what's something for the future i, I think it has been this it, that you're right lauren there is there's positives to come out of this things have changed and i'd hope that in in the second wave that is coming i think we probably are all in that planning of it is coming that we'll just be a when i hope that all of us who've been through it the first time go into it a second time a bit more prepared to be at home and i think we will um, and even for you ross sort of not sure what's come out of it i think if it happens again you will feel more prepared you'll feel a bit more sort of okay this is what's coming and people around you i hope will sort of actually be a bit more prepared about okay these are the things we can send to home these are the things we can do because I think even if you can't think of it now I think we will have learned things because it will be different you know everything about COVID has been new there's not been a single thing about it we've known anything we've related it to similar things but it's all new and I think second time around it will be different for us thank you Sasha yeah, I mean, for me, it's been just reinforcing, I think, what we knew before COVID, but weren't doing very well, which is human connection and taking time to talk and utilising things like Zoom and Skype for you know, virtual conferencing software to not just for patients, but for staff, for staff well-being. And um, it's really hard to get around and see staff in a mobile dispersed workforce like an ambulance service. Uh, and this gives us a really great opportunity to actually change that. And um, it, it doesn't work for everybody, but it's and it's not a replacement for face-to-face -face, but it's a really powerful add-on and it's something um, we'll certainly look to use in the future. Thank you and Lorna. Yes I suppose slightly just adding on from that make good friends with your IT teams really sort of now just make good friends with them they're there to help you they've really risen to the challenge you can, if you've got good IT systems, you've got good remote access systems, it means that you can include your staff in Microsoft meetings, you can see your patients, you can even do things, I've, I've done mentoring with my junior colleague where both of us have been on the, on the screen at the same time, she's been with the patient, I've been there sort of guiding her through um, procedures, but you need, you need to make those contacts now, if you've not made them now, before now, make them now because we are going to be in this situation again, so get prepared for it. If anyone has anything else to say, please just let us know now. Um, okay, great. So, just, oh, yep, go on, Kat. I just want to say thank you for thinking of us. Oh, I think, you know, I think that's you, you don't probably realize how much it will have meant to people at home to actually have this podcast and to have an opportunity for, to us to sort of give a voice to the people at home who I think, you know, and it's not meant as a criticism, it's just we're the forgotten workforce. And I think, you, you, you know, you've really given us a public sort of setting to be able to say we're still here, we're not forgotten, we are still there and thank you. So, uh, thanks for that. But honestly, uh, my, my massive thanks goes to you guys for being on this panel. So, you know, we are such a flexible workforce and we are actually, you know, really adaptable to change. And this pandemic, this crisis is no different. And for those sitting at home that are listening to this and who completely relate and who are still going through that, you know, emotional, emotional turmoil, please listen to all these fantastic people who are completely inspirational in their own way, sharing their story, but also know that you are valued. Also know that what you are doing 
is meaningful, it adds value, we appreciate you, we respect you, and we all want to say a massive thank you from all of us on the panel. And, you know, as sad as it may be, that's not recognised by your team or your managers. Please don't think that is the end. Like Lorna said, understand the value in what you're doing. Let's put, let's, you know, put some emphasis on yourself and realise how much, how important you've been in these roles. You know, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, everyone. And thank you all for being on this podcast.